are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Yes, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Um, As promised in a previous podcast, I have a guest with me today to discuss the school to prison pipeline. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Jason Edgar. Mr. Jason Edgar, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. Thank you for for joining us. Uh, I wanted someone on the show who had way more knowledge than I did about the school to prison pipeline, who could speak about uh, what it is, what what contributes to it, and how we in the black community could perhaps change the direction that it's going in. Um, First to begin with, can you tell the listeners a little about yourself? Sure. I am currently working for the... University of North Florida, here in Jacksonville. I work in college admissions, financial aid, university rules, and policy. Okay. I am also a doctoral student at the same university working on my doctorate in educational leadership, and my dissertation will be on the school to prison pipeline. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about the school to prison pipeline? Sure. In a nutshell, the line is a fast track from suspension, school suspension, to being out in the streets into the school prison, excuse me, to the prison system. So in the past, if there had been any type of infractions at school, you might have spent time in the principal's office, but then you were able to go back and resume your normal studies. I would say since the mid nineties, there has been a radical change where most of the major infractions where it started off to dealing with gun violence and suspending and removing students that carry guns to school and rightfully so because you want parents want peace of mind for the children there, it has changed. So for the least infraction school, students are being suspended and in some cases expelled versus trying to deal with what the issue is. So if the child is not in the school, they are in the streets. Being in the streets, you are certainly apt to be more susceptible to crime. And even when you're in school, there are no guidance counselors. There are school resource officers and there are police officers and they will arrest you and bring you into school, excuse me, to, to be charged. And each infraction leads to a deeper suspension, a heavier suspension. Some of them are criminal and you spend more of your time in front of a judge than in a classroom. And ultimately you find yourself convicted for the most inane of crimes. So versus trying to skip somebody for, for being gifted, that you accelerate them closer to prison. So that is really the school to prison pipeline. Mm, that is uh, that is a travesty in itself. I mean, um, before we go further, you mentioned that you were doing your dissertation on this topic. What led you to choose this topic as a dissertation? Through my entire academic life, I have never had a black male teacher. Two black females, but never a black male teacher. And I always wondered why. You always try to find someone to emulate. You're looking for someone, for lack of choice or better word, black like me, male like me. 
and I didn't see any of those. And we have been, as black males, continually, continuously excluded from making any meaningful contribution. And I realized that it starts at the educational level, that if we are being excluded from schools because we are being suspended for whether it's clowning around, speaking back versus white students who are actually doing more violent infractions, then we are not able to participate, pursue a higher education. And then we don't have that opportunity. So we don't have an opportunity to pursue a higher degree. Most of the professions now, you need some type of degree, whether it's a bachelor's or even an associate's. And financially, none of us, I should say none, it's really too strong a word. Most of us don't have the wealth accumulated to pay for college. We rely upon resources, whether it's friends, family, family extended family, or even federal financial aid. And if we have a conviction for drug use, drug possession, drug trafficking, that will affect our ability to receive federal financial aid. So we have effectively been cut off from pursuing the probably the second tenet of the American dream, which is an education behind a house. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so far, you've mentioned the fact that um, students in the past used to be maybe suspended at the most expelled for minor infractions. But as of late, I guess maybe it started during the Reagan era or maybe the, the first Bush era. But well, go ahead. The, the foundation was laid in the Reagan era. Mm. Through law and order. The scaffolding was built during the Clinton administration. Mm. And no offense to the Hillary supporters out there, but she made a statement about super predators. Oh, man. And it was not specifically identified. Or let me rephrase that. It wasn't, she didn't specifically state that it was black male youth. But given what was going on at the time, the unrest that was going on at the time, that's who it was targeted towards. Yeah. So it started off in 94, Congress passed the Federal Gun-Free School Act. Mm -hmm. And that, by its very name, that was the intention, was to make schools a gun-free environment and then to punish those students who did bring guns to school for obvious reasons. As time has, and it, it, it sounded nice, but it certainly affected inner city schools more readily than suburban schools. It has since taken a life totally different from what its original intention was. And as I said, so now it's not just bringing a gun to school, it is being disorderly, it is being uh disobedient you it, it is almost to the point this is probably the predecessor of now if you are on a plane and you even said the word bomb and you would be considered a terrorist or right. doing a terrorist act right that if you were in a school and you acted out for whatever reason uh through a temper tantrum especially if in grade school you could be charged or uh, taken away for the, the strangest of things. There, there's been a few instances where even fighting, let, let's just put it this way. Uh, let's say that you were fighting. So, yeah, you can sit there and say that that would warrant discipline or, or even a suspension. I'm not going to go so far as to say that fighting in school should be condoned. Right. But... The penalties for some schools and some school districts, anything after that is another violation of school policy, 
which warrants another suspension and it accumulates. And then for so many quote unquote demerits, then you are expelled or can be referred to juvenile court. Hmm. So uh, you mentioned juvenile court and statistics show that the groups that are most targeted by this um, school to prison pipeline are students of color, students, Absolutely. students who have been abused, neglect, mm-hmm. neglected, the poor, Correct. and even mm-hmm. people with learning disabilities. Now, that, yes. <laughs> that last one really throws me for a loop. And, I, I, and believe me, I'm bothered by this, the people of color one, too. But people with learning disabilities why why would why do you think this phenomenon um, encompasses even people who have a actual a problem with learning why would you target those people as well do you have an idea about that misdiagnosis uh, certainly lack of training for for diagnosis no offense let's put it this way school the teaching profession is the a profession that has the highest demand the highest impact on someone's life but has the least amount of resources offered to it right and i think that between what Teachers are what skills they they bring to the table, as well as what is available at the school, depending on where you are at. You may not have that ability to effectively and properly diagnose that issue. So as as a personal example, not to say that she was placed in the school to prison pipeline, but certainly misdiagnosed, where uh, a family member of mine was left back a grade, but it wasn't until after she was left back that she was diagnosed as having dyslexia. Mm. Now, if it had been noted in the beginning of the prior grade, I would like to think that whatever adjustments would be able to take place to allow her to be successful academically through that grade that she had to repeat and then be on track with everyone else. At the same time, I think that we, as black people, do not have access to adequate health care for us to diagnose ourselves. Right. So it's a double-edged sword. You're touching on a topic that I've listened to. Are you familiar with Dr. Umar Johnson? I have heard of the name, but not completely familiar with his work. Okay, Dr. Umar Johnson is a school psychologist who makes the rounds a lot, speaking about uh, the misdiagnoses of black children and how mm-hmm. um, how it's it's done on a racial level and um, how it actually eventually contributes to the school-to-prison pipeline itself. And one of the things he mentioned is that a lot of black kids, especially black boys, are misdiagnosed as having a learning disability when that's not really the case. You mentioned, yes. that, you mentioned that oftentimes it's a lack of resources on the teacher's part, a lack of understanding, etc. But Dr. Umar mentioned something, and I'd, I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on this. He said that when you look at the teaching profession, most of the teachers are women, And of those women, most of them tend to be white women. And these white women are in the schools dealing with black boys that they don't understand and that they are frankly afraid of. Can you speak to that? Can you speak to your your knowledge or your observations of that, that there's a fear of the black boy and the fear of the black boy is what's pushing a lot of these uh, teachers to kind of misdiagnose and send these boys to learning disability classes, et cetera. Can you speak to that? Yes, I, I, I tend to agree with that, that black boys tend to be 
adultize, for lack of choice, for a better word. I'm making up a new word. I'm sure Oxford English Dictionary is not going to appreciate that. They probably won't, but it's but a great word. We'll, we'll go along with that. Yes, we will. Where they, they're made to be older than they actually are. And then they are treated as if they are adults to such a point that they have even been hypersexualized, mm -hmm. even at the grade school level. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, white female instructors are possibly afraid of black boys because they, they think they look so much bigger than, than they, or older than what they actually pretend to be, or not to pretend to be, that's, that's, not, that's not true, uh, than they actually are. Yeah. So whether they treat them more harshly, uh, over, over medicate, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not one to immediately say that the solution to whatever ails you is found in a pill. Right. I would like to think that there are other options that are available, whether it, it change of diet, change of lifestyle, maybe just maybe the child is actually gifted and just is not motivated in the in the program that he is in so he might actually be smarter has anyone ever considered testing that child to be maybe he deserves to be in a gifted program where he's actually challenged he's probably under challenged i find that more so strangely enough in caribbean and and african families um where if they immigrate over usually they're a grade or two ahead versus their american counterparts yeah and it just seems to manifest itself because the schools, once they get here, they're brought back and the, the, the child is saying, like, I've already done this. Mm -hmm. And more likely than not, they're not going to be motivated. They're not going to be engaged. So they're going to do things other that the instructor probably would not appreciate. You make an excellent point there. Um, I've noticed that... Um, here's what I've noticed as well. I've noticed that... <clears throat> The school, the way the school is designed, the way education in the grade school era is designed is that even though there's different learning styles, there's pretty much just one teaching style. And I've always said to people that if you have four or five different learning styles that people could ascribe to, but you only teach to one of them, which is most times along the lines of rote memorization, mm -hmm. then you've just alienated three quarters of the learning population, in my opinion. Of the three quarters, some might do, some might manage to get by, some won't do so well, and some will do poorly. And I think that's also something that should be looked at. Have the, have, has that come across to you in your research? Yes. And what you, you let's just say that, but when schools are graded by output, they don't have the time, and it's not fair to them, they don't have the time to design lesson plans to the other 75%. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this, the, the deck is stacked against the other 75%. Mm -hmm. Because schools are graded by academic success, the schools, the students that get through the program. If the school was failing, then obviously principals, teachers, they are replaced, schools are closed, kids are shifted to other schools. Um, now, unfortunately, the other side of that is pushing children through the system just to get them moving and make the grades look good. Let's look at what happened in the Atlanta public school system just last year, if not year before, uh, if memory serves, where teachers were cooking the grades or just allowing students to pass just to get them moving to make themselves look good. And I would imagine also they probably had performance that is tied to that. So if my performance is tied to having students appear successful when they're not actually successful, then shame on us for creating a system that encourages that. It's interesting you bring that up. I do remember that, that 
that case, and they charged all those teachers involved with a RICO charge, which is usually for folks who were involved in heavy drug trafficking. They really came down heavy on those teachers for that. Um, but yeah, um, you, you bring up a good point. So structurally, the education system is, is not serving 75% of the students to begin with. Add to that. No. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm disagreeing. I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, yes. So add to that, seven, add to that you have teachers from another race, especially in these inner city schools, who, and I could speak to this personally, um, I, I remember having some kids in a school where the teachers really didn't care to be teachers. They were really lawyers. They were white Women, they were really lawyers, but they were trying to get half of their loans um, forgiven, you know, that loan forgiveness program type thing. So they they were just buying their time, biding their time. And their interests in the students weren't so great. So you add the structural, you add the prejudice. Um, that right there alone gives you your school-to-prison pipeline, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It, it ties into something called the critical race theory, where it, in, in a nutshell, the critical race theory is that politics and laws were designed with race in mind, where it, marginalization, uh, you can probably sit there and throw sexism there in some aspects, right. but from the founding of the country to now, all the laws are based on race. And it puts a lens on the way everything is viewed, as we just talked about with instructors, with lawyers, uh, with policy, that it falls back to marginalization of that group that we are trying to undo almost 400 years, over 400 years of an oppressive system for all intents and purposes in the short span of 47 years, if you go from the starting of slavery to the Voting Rights Act of 70, 1970, 1971, something like that. Mm -hmm. So as most people, if you kind of counted it that way, black people have only been free for 47 years. Wow. That's very true. We've only been free for a little less than fifty years. In in that and in in that's kind of in a subjective term, you know, But yes, for forty seven years. Very interesting. So, when I was doing my research into the topic, I was looking at some people's proposal as to why it seems that. Um, minorities, blacks in particular, are most affected by this. And, you know, it's always interesting to see um, people's thoughts on these types of things because the average person who's non-black, they never want to discuss the racism. So they give all these varying things all around the topic of race. One of the things that I saw come up was this idea that the crackdown in schools or the the um, the addition of actual police officers in schools was due to the Columbine situation where a group of white kids came into the school in Columbine um, in Colorado and shot up the school. Mm -hmm. But that, does, that, that was a group of white kids that did that. That doesn't explain why so many black kids are being targeted. Uh, if you remember, about a year or two ago, there was a black girl in in a school. I forget where it was, but she was in a classroom. They said something like the teacher asked her to leave, and she wouldn't leave the class. So a white police officer comes in there and tosses this black girl around the classroom like a rag doll. Do you remember that? I believe that was in South Carolina. Oh, was it South? Okay. 
Okay. I, I, I want to say that it was. Yeah. If, I, I could be wrong, but somehow South Carolina seems to come to mind, but I, I do remember that incident vividly. Yeah. And Columbine was in 99, mm-hmm. right around tax time, if memory serves. Mm. Um, that in, in, in that instance, it's almost, it, it kind of reminds me of the uh, opioid epidemic that we're going through now, that it's, it, it only, school resource officers only became a, a topic of conversation once white people became affected. Right. Mm-hmm. To, to quote Richard Pryor, uh, it's an epidemic when white people are involved. <laughs> yeah. And in that instance, it comes back to certainly the zero tolerance policies that are there that there is no, there's no counselors, there's no resource for counselors. And I would have to imagine, although I am not in the school administrative system, so I'm probably taking a leap of faith in this statement that it's easier to shift that budget to a school resource officer that may be a city police officer because of the city budget Mm -hmm. um, versus having a counselor on the school's payroll. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's probably somewhere in there that the, the time and effort has to be paid or, or paid back to that to the city, mm-hmm. but it's easier to punish and destroy than to support and build. And in, in that instance, I would say very much so that the school chose not to investigate, counsel, even constructively discipline that student. Mm. Because every any in any discipline opportunity, there's always for for constructive development, and I don't think that they took that opportunity to to address that. Hmm. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it seems like it's a myriad of things, and um, after we take this quick station break, I'd like to come back and discuss two things: solutions, potential solutions, and let's discuss the for-profit prison system that I believe is really the villain here. Okay, so let's just take a quick station break. We'll be right back. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Okay, Jason, thank you. Thank you. Now we're back. Um, I said before the the bump that... um, I want to talk about two things remaining. I want to talk about possible solutions. But before that, let's talk about the for-profit prison system and how that probably is what plays the huge role in all of this to begin with. Can we, exactly. Can we, can, we, can we talk about that just a little bit? What are your thoughts about that? Well, in, in an effort to make America great again, (laughs) we have to get people to work. Yes. And we have moved well past a manufacturing economy. So service is the only thing that is left Mm. unless you deal with construction, but even still. And where the the current administration appeal to the masses is the middle of America. Yeah. Which is, at least in the way the media portrays it, lower educated blue collar people. Yeah. And if we're not going to subsidize them in farming, we're not going to open up any mines. We're going to have to put something there to get them back to work. And it, yes, it will be the prisons. So CCA, if I remember correctly, is Correction Corporation of America. I've probably misrepresented the CCA. 
but they are the predominant for-profit uh, prison systems out there. Mm-hmm. And yes, they do build the prisons out in the rural areas, hiring the people there to be the wardens, the corrections officers, the other staff, whatever other support entities there are for there. And it will help those communities, but we will be the widgets in the warehouse. Yes, yes. I um yeah many years ago I had to go visit someone who was in who was incarcerated in Sing in Sing Sing Sing, uh, it's upstate New York, and um, I can tell you firsthand if you've never done this before, if you've never visited someone in one of these prisons, those towns are almost ghost towns and they're built around the prison. Everyone in the town has something to do that relates back to the prison. And the towns are 90 plus percent white, by the way. And like you said, we are the widgets in there. We are the, we are the machines in these prisons that actually power these small towns and give them a local economy. And I think it's a bit of a shame. Um, As a matter of fact, I was looking it up really, I'm sorry, recently. And, I was looking at the color of mass incarceration. And the statistics say that 61% of incarcerated people are black or Latino. Yep. Versus the fact that black or Latino only make up 30% of the U.S. population. That means that you have to be criminalizing black and Latino more than you criminalize anyone else for that to be the numbers, right? It also... Sounds about right, yes. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It also says that one out of three African-American males will be incarcerated in his lifetime, which is, mm-hmm. which is mind-boggling to me. And one out of six Latino males will be incarcerated in his lifetime. And I think it's what, one out of 12 for white, if memory serves. Something like that. One out of 12 or 13, yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that seems to be the numbers. Like one out of 12 for white, and I'd say one out of 15 for Asian, if, if that statistic holds true. Wow. So, yes, we, we are the, the targets for the, the simplest of infractions. I, I will never forget, this was... Not too long after September 11th, Mm -hmm. where a black person was um, standing at a sign that said no standing, and he got a ticket. Wow. But that's for vehicles. (laughs) But he got a ticket for no standing, and he went to to the court. And he, he went in front of the judge, and the judge asked him, what was he charged for? And he said, no standing. And the judge asked him, well, what vehicle were you in? He's like, I wasn't. I was just standing. I was standing by the sign, and I was ticketed for no standing. Amazing. So in, in that instance, while certainly if nothing else, it, it shows the time and effort that's, that law enforcement is looking to target people of color. Because would that have necessarily happened to a white person? I sincerely doubt it, because now we're kind of roaming into the realm of stop and frisk, Mm -hmm. uh, giving them justification to do other things, which has gone by the wayside. But I still feel that it's still lurking there in the background in some way, shape or form. Um, But if, if you're trying to increase the statistics to say that crime is going down, where are you going to go? to find, to get a better set of results from your efforts. Um, you're not going to cast your net in ocean, in, in water that doesn't have any fish. You're going to cast your net where you might catch something justifiably or not. Yes. And it's going to be in the communities where people of color, people from lower incomes. Yes. Mm-hmm. You're going to find someone that has, even at the very least, you're going to find someone that 
even unintentionally, you can probably find a way for them to break their parole violation because, as we just said, one in three black males have seen prison, so they already have a record. So if they're doing something, they can make up something to say that you broke your your parole and find yourself back in prison. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that relates back to the school to pipeline. In, yes, in the sense that, as you mentioned at the top of the show, um, when you are suspending kids and expelling them, et cetera, from school, they're going back into these environments where if you're not in school, what are you doing? You're going to be running with a certain crowd or you're going to be engaging in activities that will, even if they are not actually criminal, they will be criminalized because the system is set that way to criminalize almost any and everything black people do. So we have this, we, we talked about the statistics of folks in prison. We talked about the for-profit prisons, which I think in minds and yours is, is key to the school-to-prison pipeline because you need to have people to fill these for-profit prisons. So like you said, you go to the group of people who uh, have limited resources, who have uh, everything that they do criminalized, and that's where you draw your people from. And, of course, the easiest place to get a black man into the prison system and for the longest time is you get him in school. You get him when he's a youth in school. So I was looking at more um, statistics of children being pushed into prison, and it, This was from PBS. They had this infographic that says that from school to prison, students of color face harsher discipline and are more likely to be pushed out of school than whites. 40% of students expelled from U.S. school each year are black. 40%. 70% of students involved in in in-school arrest or referred to law enforcement are black or Latino. Correct. 3.5 3.5 times, uh, black students are 3.5 times more likely to be suspended than whites. Uh, black and Latino students are twice as, lack, uh, twice as likely not to graduate from high school as whites. 68, 68% of all males in state and federal prison do not have a high school diploma. So that last statistic shows you that it's directly involved is directly from the schools to the prison. So with all of that said and those stats laid out, Jason, um I want to talk about potential solutions. And I did a podcast recently that talked about low energy individuals tainting black society. Now, in this whole in this whole conversation that we've had, I never once mentioned white supremacy. Um, I know that term scares a lot of people sometimes. I know some people believe it's not true. It's just black folks not not uh, pulling up their own own uh, socks or whatever the, the term is. But as you and I talked about in this conversation, there is a system that criminalizes blackness. Uh, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but there's a system that criminalizes blackness and and it, and it helps to um, shuttle us into the prison from schools. When I talked about that low-energy um, phenomenon, um, I defined it as people amongst us who are naysayers. You could include there's a lot of pessimism in the black community, but generally the low-energy means it, that it's... Folks who are just unmotivated, kind of boring, um, not thinking out of the box, not challenging anything, not stepping up. What do you think is the cause of that? Do you agree with that, first of all? What do you think is the cause of it, if you do agree? How do we change that? I would say, you know, a good chunk of it is lack of exposure. Yeah. And... I'm going to speak for myself personally and then spread out a little bit. Go for it. When 
I was a child, my grandfather, my grandfather is the one who raised me. And I knew of a bachelor's degree. I knew of a master's degree. I knew of a doctorate degree. Bef by the time I was in kindergarten, I had no idea what it was. I could tell you by the time I was six, I could tell you the hooding ceremony of a doctorate. I had the foggiest idea what a doctorate was. Mm. But I could tell you what happened in it because my grandfather told me. Now, my grandfather has nothing more than a high school education, but he valued education. Mm -hmm. And he put that idea in my head to, to make that education a priority. And I think that, as we talked about, families have to have that incentive, that motivation to say that having a great jump shot or an athletic gift should not be the ticket out of whatever situation that you are in that you have to, because you, you can break your ankle and, and or do damage to your knee and your career is over. Mm -hmm. um, but in that same vein, if all you know and all you see is negativity, and even when people try to make an effort, they, they look at the negative, they don't look at, okay, that at least the effort, there should be some celebration in the effort or at least the trying or someone to emulate. I think that that's where we fall short is that there are not enough role models for us to, to at least, or supporters, even if they can't do it, push and promote someone else out of that situation and encourage them to reach back and bring the next person. Not everyone, I would love to say that everyone is equal no, because if that was the case, everyone would be a Usain Bolt. Everyone would be the next Steve Jobs or, or, or Reginald Johnson. Mm -hmm. That's or Bob Johnson. That's that's not the case. People should have similar opportunities. But even if we can, we should be able to push and promote and have the you know. If we don't have the energy, we should at least give the energy to someone else, or make sure that if they seem lethargic, I, I hate to say it so much, but put a foot in the rear to get them moving. Indeed. And I, I that is probably the, 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 the foundation is that we don't promote each other. We are still very selfish. Uh, we don't want anyone. We as a people don't want anyone else to be better than us. So more likely than not, we're going to downplay it. We're going to be the naysayer because we don't want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. It's the old misery like loves company type thing. Exactly. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we are having a discussion here with Mr. Jason Edgar about the school to prison pipeline. So far, we've discussed uh, what it is, um, who it affects the most, and at this point, we're starting to talk about solutions a little bit. But before we get deeper into solutions, we're actually talking about the fact that within the black community, there is a, a, a bit of a low energy phenomenon. And uh, Jason, when, when you and I spoke before uh, actually beginning the podcast, you said something interesting I took note of. You said you were talking about the idea where a lot of black folks want to be the HNIC. But, and you wanted to be the HNIC, but then you noticed that you were the ONIC. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. We all know HNI stands for head, head Negro in Charge. Mm -hmm. In my corporate life, being the ONIC was O for only, that more likely than not, as I reached executive level in my career, that I was the only black person there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it certainly forced me to be more cognizant of who I am and what I did. And I would almost say, I didn't want to say that I'm willing to sacrifice my blackness, but certainly not put my blackness on parade unless really warranted. Mm -hmm. Whereas... As a white person, I could be whomever I wanted to be, however I wanted to be, if I were white. Yeah. Um, so in that instance, it, it was very lonely in 
in those environments to try and find someone to be a mentor or to be someone supportive to help guide me through those mind those minds that I might very well step on. Mm-hmm. And that reflects certainly on our environment now that yes, you can see people that want to be the next Cam Newton or the next Kevin Durant. But like I said, you don't see fine people that want to be the next Bob Johnson, the former CEO of BET, or um, uh, what is his name? Jordan, who is the CEO of the chain that owns Red Lobster, uh, Outback, and stuff like that. Uh, Ken Chenault, former CEO of American Express, that uh, you, you don't see that. And I, I think that in that dearth environment, it's because we, we don't have the opportunity to pursue an education, to be in that environment, to be in those conversations, to be in that development, to help set whether it's corporate or public policy and make the, be those change makers. Yes, and, and I'd like to even add um, Neil deGrasse Tyson as one of these folks who should be looked up yes. upon higher than he is. I, I think a, a lot of white society embraces him because he's he he has good humor and he you know he's he's smart he's he's one of the smartest people on the planet um but the reason why i wanted to to bring that the hnic versus onic up to tie all these threads together is because that's one of the things i i count that also as low energy when you have people who just want to do the things that people expect of you the people expect you to you know, you're a black guy. People expect you to play basketball. You know, um, mm-hmm. they expect you to be into rap music or to be a rapper. And we as a community, I feel, we tend to allow our children to go down these routes. Sometimes we encourage them to go down these routes, but we never break down the statistics of that stuff. And the statistics basically say that that's a one in a million chance that you will get into rap music, uh, basketball, and become some big millionaire. And so then what ends up happening is, like, as you mentioned, that you went through, I've gone through myself, we get into these more corporate-type jobs or these jobs in academia, and we're the only one there. We're the only one who has our Mm -hmm. own backs. And that's a function of our folks, to me, in my humble opinion, being low-energy, always sticking to the same routines, staying in the same box that someone else designed for you. And we got to break that chain. We got to get out of it. We have to encourage our kids to to see that there's more that they can do out there. Like um, Neil, um, oh, he, he, he has this thing. I've seen him say it a few times. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he has this thing he says, when you have children, just give them the tools that they need and get the hell out of the way. They will find their way. They are natural scientists. They'll find their way. But when we create these environments where they have nothing, you you don't give them any tools to work with, that's what leads them into to be in these schools that's already looking for them, that's already trying to harvest them into this prison system, and they fall right into it. They fall right into the trap. That is very true. You know, as we were talking about a little while ago, that we are leaving behind seventy-five percent of our learners out there. It does force us to question whether or not the current education system still is still valid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to a few colleagues and. and former classmates of mine, we were asking ourselves that same question. And I think that it bears consideration to look at the past models of, let's say, Booker T. Washington with the HBCs, where they were, and I'm using those terms for then, agricultural, mechanical, agricultural, and technical. Not to say that everyone has to be a farmer, not by by, by that intention, but that while for every scientist 
that there is out there, there is a tradesperson, there is a business person, there is a counselor, there is a teacher that we, we should be able to develop uh, our, our youth in, in ways, as you just said, give them the tools. So for every person that wants to drive a Benz, there has to be a person to design the Benz. There has to be a person to fix the Benz. Mm -hmm. For every person that wants the mansion, there has to be a person to build the house. Mm -hmm. There has to be a person to design, you know, put in the plumbing. Uh, it's, you, you call a plumber, plumbers aren't cheap. It's a, it's a required profession. Not everything is going to, not everyone's going to be that next scientist. And I'm not discrediting the need to be the next scientist. You are a science person. I'm not discrediting your profession by any stretch of your imagination, mm -hmm. but everyone has a place in the sun is, yeah. is what I'm driving at. And everyone should have that opportunity to explore and develop that skill to the best of their ability. And not everyone is going to be the next Jay-Z. Not everyone is going to be the next Kobe. Yeah. You, unfortunately, we are we are all circling around a, a, an average, so to speak. And the yes, there will be outliers, but if everyone is an outlier, then there'd be a, a, a void in the middle. Good. So, as you begin to work on your dissertation, um, and you talk about this topic. What are some of the? Uh, I don't think dissertations work like this, but just but just just bear with me for a second. What are some of the solutions you think these groups that that are finding themselves um, at these high percentages in the schools to prison pipeline? What what do you think needs to be done? Because we, we, we talked about what's done in education, what's done with law enforcement, what's done with for-profit prisons. But what can we do at home? What can be done in the community well, as a whole? What can be done in the community? Well, the, the current practice is something called restorative justice, where the victim and the offender work out with mediation to address the issue. That's that's the current solution. I've never been particularly fond about that because that the problem after the issue. So we need to look at the source because the school to prison pipeline that just slows the flow down. That doesn't dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is look at certainly we have to develop a from the the community's perspective to engage the school districts to develop or force them to develop a consistent form of here's the infractions. I, I to say, well, okay, this warrants this, this warrants this, and versus, well, okay, if I choose to wear my hair natural and that violates the school code. Suspension. No, that that's that's not the case. Um, that's that is first and foremost. We need to develop a, a consistent level of punishment or suspension, whatever you want to call it. The second one, certainly more prominent, is look at students and develop them versus tear them down. As we talked about earlier in the in in our podcast that we identify the troubled students, but we don't identify the gifted students. Why is it that they are not being pushed forward? Mm -hmm. And I, I can say that for the most part, I, I, I look at my myself and I didn't come up with a silver spoon in my mouth by any stretch of imagination. And I got my bachelor's, I graduated. Thank you, Lordy, not come Lordy. But I, I, there were people, even the instructors, they supported who I was, and I don't see that now. I, it's going to take a drastic shift in policy and development to change those lenses that we just talked about of demonizing, hypersexualizing black students. 
male or female, because the school to prison pipeline affects both male and female considerably more than whites and Asians. Yeah. Um, so those would be the two biggest ones in my immediate mind is developing a more consistent form of if there is t- some type of discipline that has to be involved, but more so how are we raising, promoting our students? How are we recognizing their development? How are we undemonizing them? How in, how are we addressing students that actually have legitimate developmental issues that just because the person suffers from ADHD, as, as an example, that does not mean that that person deserves to be excluded from an opportunity to be successful. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so when, when you talk about engaging the school districts, is that, a, is that just as simple as um banding together doing pta meetings uh does that involve legislation what does what does that really involve that is that 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 is easy that sounds it's far harder than it sounds okay um i would imagine not being in the school district but looking at it it sounds nice to just say that it's a pta meeting but we have to be engaged at the school board level. And these meetings are open to the public. They don't happen clandestinely. Mm -hmm. But we have to take the effort to be there and voice our opinion. Usually where I see parents, as to say historically, it's it's usually when it involves busing or or, or something along those lines, but not necessarily Mm -hmm. so much the... Um, the actual layout of school policy in the school district. I see when it comes to zoning, but but not too much more than that. But yes, to be engaged, I would start off, yes, at the school level, because in some instances, it is a school policy versus a district policy. But the, the district lays out kind of like this guideline and they just kind of, the schools match or, or try to fashion themselves according to, to district policy. So I would say, yes, yeah, start at the school, but the power is at the school, at the district level. And you have to reach out to those people and pressure them. Because to speaking for Duval County, these are elected positions. And they will listen to the people that if you can wield enough votes, they will bend your way. If you if you are not engaged, you don't if you if you're not counted. Or they don't feel that you count, they won't count for you. You don't count to them. So it does point to having the energy to beat the naysayers like, oh, you can go there and nothing is going to change. Change does not happen immediately. It it takes time. It takes effort. It takes a sustained effort. And I think that we seek in the 21st century, we seek immediate gratification. And if we try it once and we don't succeed, we give up. And then folks say, it didn't work. Well, no, it, it, you're right. It didn't work, but it didn't work this time. It doesn't say it won't work the next time. Mm-hmm. We have to push and promote because we all are of those people that someone might present an idea to us individually. And we may not buy it the first time. We might engage in conversation maybe a second time, a third time, where we get the other person to see our point of view and then make a change. For example, this podcast, some people may not immediately agree with what we are talking about, but at least it puts the idea in their head to think about it and then say, hmm, well, maybe I I don't necessarily agree with 100 percent of what Jason or Koku says, but maybe if I tried it this way, it will help me achieve the goal that I want. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, that makes sense. So, you know, we talked about, um, actually you mentioned 
a lot of times when parents get involved, it's with school boards or school districts, it's to talk about busing. And it's so funny you said that because immediately I, I thought back to when a friend had a lot of problems with the school and it was primarily about the busing situation. But there was there was never any discussion about, you know, what's being taught, how it's being taught, how are the students being disciplined. Do you think as black folks we put too much faith into systems that weren't really designed for us to begin with? Yes. Um I I we we put too much faith in others to look out for us. Yeah. And I think we we need to have our best interest at heart. And I say we collectively, not just me Mm -hmm. because when looked at collectively i am a black face just like the next person and when the school board looks at me they don't see me as an individual um they see me as a black person Mm -hmm. and i think that what frightens the the establishment is seeing you know and i guess looking from a historic point a united black front, and and I'm sounding communist, but that's really not the intention, but a a united black group, no matter what it is, if they are united and focused, that causes great contention and concern because that shows that there is unity for a society that has developed by dismantling us from dissecting us as an individual, dissecting us as a family, that when you, you look at a broken family, it's no male figure, it's it's not a two-parent household, or uh, it's a inverted household or an extended family that what is doing something that should be mother, father, you know, and children, or husband, wife, and children, that when there's that unity, that's what makes everything more dynamic, more productive, as opposed to you know several different independent agendas. Yes. You just mentioned something that jogged my memory. I, I know there was something else I wanted to, to, point, to point out and to ask you about. Um, in the statistics about um, ch- children being punished into prison, they look at foster care to prison. And let me pull up the stats here. They say that um, 50% of children in the foster care system are black and Latino. Uh 30% of foster care youth entering the juvenile justice system are placement-related behavioral cases. So, in other words, they were considered bad kids in school. 25% 25% of young people leaving foster care will be incarcerated within a few years after turning 18. 50% of young people leaving foster care will be unemployed within a few years after turning 18. And therefore, 70% of inmates they found in the U.S., uh, particularly in California State Prison, are former foster care youth. Oftentimes, it's talked about in the black community that we have a fatherless black community. Now, research has kind of dispelled this. Um, Research has shown that while the father might not be married to the mother, might not be living at home, black fathers, more than any other group, are involved in children's lives. Can you speak to this notion of... well? Can you speak to how important it is, if it is or if it isn't, to have both parents? Will that change the outcome of the prison, um, school-to-prison pipeline? Um, is it a is it a fatherlessness problem? Is it a marriage problem? Can you give me your thoughts on that? I don't necessarily believe that it is a marriage problem. Okay. Um, I'm sure that there are a few people that are happily married and have children, and and I'm not disparaging, I'm not casting any disparaging comments on the institution of marriage. Yeah. 
But I do believe that a supportive and whole family of mother and father should be there to promote the interest and support the child. That to me makes a world of a difference than just being married because there are a lot of, there, there are married couples that are not supportive of their children. So being married is not the end all and be all. Right. It is being the present, you know, mother and father, because when children come up in, in broken homes, not taking anything away from the grandparents, because my grandparents raised me. Yeah. That for, for me, let, let me, let me put it this way. For, for the longest time when my parents broke up and my grandparents raised me, I felt unwanted by my parents. Mm. And it was, my grandparents did a wonderful job to try and bridge that gap to let me know that they loved and cared for me. But when you, when you look at your parents and you wonder why I'm laid together, you, you, you wonder if it was because of me. Yes. And I think that having those parents at least when possible and certainly supportive environment to both of them to support the child is, is always a good thing. If they can't be together, then they should still support the child and not denigrate each other because then the child is going to carry that negativity to, with their relationship going forward, whoever they're with. And therefore act out in school and just feed right into the, feed right into the problem. That is true. You have to come a little closer to the mic. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, um, yeah. Because then when a, a child who goes through that, they, I probably tend to act out in school and yes. feed right into the, the actual problem that we're talking about. Uh, I do believe that black fathers are important, even if they're not living in the home, but important in terms of being disciplinarian. And now that makes me think about that it. That is very true. That's yeah. very, very true. Sometimes. That was, when, that was my father. That okay. was my father. Okay. Because I, I found I find that sometimes when fathers are not in the home, they um, they take a step back from being the disciplinarian. I mean, let's face it: you're not in the home, you're not around the kids all the time. When you do see them, you don't want to be the disciplinarian sometimes, and I get that. But at the same time, the lack of discipline is what has some of these kids of us acting out in school and feeding into the system that's trying to get them anyway. Yes. So, so I, I think you and I both agree there is, a, there is that necessity and these statistics that I just read off talking about foster parents, there is something to your actual parents, your, your natural parents being there, encouraging you, disciplining you, and everything in between to make you um, be better as a student in the school, and to avoid this pipeline. So that, to me, is a solution as well. We need our parents to be present. We need them to be disciplinary. But at the same time, we need them to kind of play that balance where even though you're a disciplinarian, a disciplinarian and you're involved, you need to kind of step back and allow the kids to find the tools, you know, to find the tools and to use the tools to expand their minds and do whatever you know, whatever comes natural to them, right? Yes. So um, exactly. let's let's take a quick station break, and on when we come back, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to let you give a, a message to the listeners. Um, let's just take a quick station break. We'll be right back. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome back to the Bit of Medicine Podcast. We've been having a great conversation here concerning the school-to-prison pipeline. Um, thank you very much to my guest, Mr. Jason Edgar, who is actually uh, working on a dissertation on this topic. He's been giving us a lot of knowledge today in this podcast. I really appreciate you coming by. Would you be interested in discussing this again 
uh, in, in the future with us? Sure, I would love to. Uh, yeah, we would like to um, hear more about your dissertation, more about your findings, because for those of you who don't know, dissertations are based on research. So that means that you're going to be heavily involved in researching what's going on in these schools, what's going on in these communities that are affected, correct? Correct. And so, yeah, we would love to hear more about it. In fact, to be honest with you, I have for a while now, I've had this idea of doing a a documentary on this phenomenon because I don't think a lot of our uninitiated black parents, um, I don't think a lot of them realize the damage that's going on and how we, through our actions or lack of actions, how we are perpetuating this cycle. So what I'm getting at is you and I who have gone to college and made the best of um, our opportunities in that in that respect, we know what's going on. We know what to look for. We know what to tell our children, um, if you have any. We know what to tell uh, our children or kids around us, what to look out for, etc. But for a lot of the the black parents who are in the inner city, for example, a lot of them themselves don't have much of an education. So how do we deal with them? Does it take one of us who has some education, who has some insight? Does it take one of us to have to be the shepherd? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And as, as I mentioned earlier in our, in our conversation, my grandfather never had a college education, didn't get past grade school. But he knew people that didn't. He put the idea in me to pursue an education. And like I said, I, I you know what's funny is that I never knew an associates existed until I was halfway through college. Mm-hmm. I thought that you started off with a bachelor's. I never knew that there was a, such a thing as an associate's degree. No offense to anyone that has an associate. I just never knew it existed. Yeah. But to to your point, yes, we need to go back to the communities and start at an early point, not just at the I'm getting ready to go to college, I'm getting ready to finish high school, you know, for those that have the opportunity to finish high school, we need to start at the grade school level to let them know how to how to engage them to to find more gifted programs, to to recognize those gifted students. Talk about any type of developmental, any type of, you know, let's look at the negative. Is there a problem? How to address it? If they are demonstrating genius level stuff, get them to the resources that they can tap into that and make that next step. And even if you are in in the middle of the, the, the pack, you still have opportunities to go to college. Let's prepare you how to get to that level, to find those scholarships, how to find that aid, because as we talked about earlier in, in, in this podcast, we as a people do not have a lot of accumulated wealth. So we're going to have to find alternative resources to help fund our children's education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have to show this the, the parents the ins and the outs. And that is one of the things that I do in college admissions and financial aid when I do speak to minority students, although to a point is usually a little bit too late because they're already in the system, but I push and promote, push and promote, push and promote to, as they talk to their peers, that I'm sure that the message gets passed along. Great, great. So I tell you what, when we speak again, we'd like to have you back on in the future. Uh, Let's talk about these alternatives, and I would like to discuss, we don't have to talk about it right now, but just to put this airworm in your head, should we remove ourselves from the education system as it is and develop our own? I know uh, a lot of people get afraid when they hear ideas that touch on separatism, but there was a time before civil rights and integration where our communities were doing much better. 
That is that is true. That we we were fine when we supported ourselves, and it, it seems that the depending on one's point of view, integration hurt us. It, we we took we took a couple of steps back with integration. Um, you know, we we can talk about the schools that are the religious schools that are are, are separate. Uh, New Yeshiva University, if if memory serves, is almost exclusively Jewish. So, and I'm sure that they do quite well. Brigham Young University um, historically was Mormons only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there there is opportunity there. Uh, I think that as we become more reliant upon outside funds, uh, we, we we take steps back uh, in, in to that end. Yeah. So I, yeah, I would love to be part of that conversation when, okay. when that rolls around. Much appreciated, Mr. Jason Edgar. Thank you very much for appearing on our podcast. We will be in contact. We would love to have you on again. Is there anything else you would like to tell uh, say to the listeners before we leave? I would love to say, do not be disheartened if you, your first success, your first attempt is not successful. It change takes time. All, all I ask is, is be supportive of each other. Once we do that, you'll be surprised with the change that will come about. Great, great final words and. Um, until next time, everyone, this has been the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Make sure to like, share, subscribe to our channel, um, like our Facebook page, Twitter. All that information is coming, but make sure to share this. This is information that our community needs, and we will have Jason on again in the future to talk more about it on a different level. So thank you again, everyone. Until next time, this is the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.